Good morning and welcome to day two of the EEP Summit. For those of you who I didn't get to meet yesterday, I'm Jim Garrett. I'm the provost of Carnegie Mellon and it's again my real pleasure to be here. I hope that everyone has been excited about the engaging discussions that you're having uh, about learning sciences and innovations that are worth exploring to enhance approaches to teaching. I'm especially excited about being here today to be part of the official reveal of the Open Simon Toolkit. Named after Carnegie Mellon's Simon Initiative, which builds upon the legendary work of esteemed CMU faculty member, scientist, and Nobel Prize winner Herbert Simon, the toolkit is a culmination of decades of exceptional interdisciplinary collaboration at our university. This work has encompassed our pioneering efforts in adaptive learning to develop software and analytics tools that leverage Carnegie Mellon's learning technology, computer science, and psychology expertise, and research and learning engineering enterprises. We aspire to make learning something that you can observe, a real experience that uniquely follows a cycle from theories of learning to instructional design and practice, from data analysis, mind to discovery, and then back again. As a result, as a result, we're unlocking this toolkit, which was funded by $100 million worth of research and development funding from prestigious organizations, including the National Science Foundation, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Walter S. Johnson, Lumina, Kresge, Department of Education, and many others who have joined CMU to improve how we deliver education to students. I'd like to thank each of these partners, as well as the Pittsburgh Council on Higher Education, or PICHI as it's known, for being long-term collaborators in this effort and for helping to bring colleges and universities together in this shared commitment. Starting today, the Open Simon Toolkit will constitute a comprehensive collection of techniques, tools, content, and code. It will serve as an open tool suite and a foundation for a broader community, like Michael talked about yesterday, represented by all of you in this room to use, to, to use leverage, continually improve, refine, and build upon again. Establishing the toolkit is just the beginning, and it's a testament to CMU's leadership in the learning science realm. Herb Simon himself once said, improvement in post-secondary education will require converting teaching from a solo sport to a community-based research activity. I, along with my colleagues here at CMU, could not agree with Herb more. Now, without further ado, it's time for the official Open Simon Toolkit reveal. I'd like, you to ask, I'd like to ask you all to join me in counting down from five, and then through the, through the wonders of theatrics, I am going to move this lever, and that screen is going to reveal the, uh, the Simon Toolkit. Let's start. Five, four, three, two, one. There it is, our latest innovation in learning engineering, now for the world to share and implement. The site is live now, and if you visit this URL, you'll be able to immediately access the tools available, join our community, and find ways to share feedback and ideas with your peers, which I highly encourage you to do regularly. Again, thank you all for taking part in this year's EEP Summit, hosted here at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I pretty much like to thank everybody sitting at this table here for all the work that they've done. I did so yesterday, and I'll just uh, do so by implication today. Um, I'd like to now introduce Dean Richard Shinus, who is the Dean of our Dietrich College of Humanities and Social Sciences, who will continue the program with a deeper dive into the toolkit's approaches and its rollout plan. Richard? <laughs> Thank you, Jim, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Michael, for hosting and getting this all to come together. Uh, and I think this is 
an exciting morning for all of us. Um, so here's a quote that Jim just read. And what we're going to try to do is make um, this idea right, come to life through the tools that we're actually going to talk about and the community we're going to try to create. So the way I sort of think of this is um, universities customarily engage in two activities, research and education, and they actually sometimes conflict because people who are doing a lot of research don't want to spend the time required to teach. Uh, Herb's idea was we need to get them to communicate and come together. And so we think of learning engineering right, as the bridge that takes research activity and applies it to educational activity and makes educational activity subject for research. And so that's really the perspective we want to um, uh, get across. So the idea of learning engineering as the way to bring research and education together and, and, has it, and how it comes to life in the work we're doing um, is illustrated in a number of ways, but let me take a, take a shot with a diagram we built to, to make it, to make it uh, come to, to vivid life. So uh, when you're trying to design or build educational materials, uh, you have to have some kind of a model of what the learner knows and what it is that the learner actually is required or desired to know. And through that learner model, a lot of data and a lot of design passes. So we think of the idea uh, of um, learning engineering as an iterative cycle between the theories of learning uh, that you might develop and improve and the educational practice that you might develop and then monitor. And so when you have a theory of learning, it helps you design a model of the learner and a model of the domain that you want the learner to learn. And then through that model, you can design activities, assessments, and other educational activities uh, that you actually give to the student and then they can do practice on. And then when you have the student participate in learning, you collect data on what they're doing and then you use that data to refine the model and then refine your theories of learning and then the cycle starts all over again. So the idea of learning engineering is to create a virtuous cycle between what we think we know about learning and what we actually give to the students in order to learn. So learning engineering uh, can be described a bunch of ways. I, I, I conceive it as having four components. Uh, the first is you need to build a model uh, of the learner and the domain that you're actually trying to teach. And by that I mean you have to have skills, concepts, chunks of knowledge that the learner can actually know, understand, be able to do, uh, and those have to uh, correspond to activities and assessments. So the second piece of the puzzle in terms of the way we understand it is aligning the activities and the assessments, right, which are the core of the learning activities, with the learner model and the domain model. So you have to align that, and we have tools and techniques for helping you do that. And the third is instrumenting the learning activities and the assessments so we get data from which we can improve things. And then the fourth is analyzing the data uh, so that we can iteratively improve and I think there's three targets for that improvement. One is to improve the model, right? You have a model of the learner, the model of the domain. Those can both be improved in response to data. And when you do so, you can improve the amount students learn. You can obviously improve the learning activities, right? You can find out which are working, which are not. And then you can improve the assessment so you can gain more access to what the students know and can do and what they can't. So that's really, I think, my picture of learning engineering. It's got those four components. And what we're going to try to do in the rest of the morning is give you some idea of the techniques and the tools that support learning engineering for anybody. So <clears throat> the first thing I, I think that um, I want to get across, but you probably are uh, in, in, in not a whole lot of need of being convinced, is that we think it works, right? And it works to actually demonstrably improve learning outcomes. So I'll give you three very quick examples, <clears throat> um, one on primary education, one on secondary, and one on higher education. Uh, the RoboTutor uh, app <clears throat> uh, was uh, built on top of software that Jack Mostow developed to teach reading to six and seven-year-olds using speech recognition. Uh, and he entered that uh, as a tablet app into the Global X Prize for Learning several years ago. And it became a finalist, which was very exciting for us. 
And now it's being tested in Africa in 30 different villages to teach students Swahili, writing, reading, and math. And the winner is going to be announced in, I think, eight days. Uh, and if we do win, or if Jack wins, it's a $10 million first prize. So uh, at about 9.30 Eastern time on May 15th, uh, everybody think positive thoughts <laughs> for, the, for, the, for the robo tutor. And the provost cut is zero. Sorry, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> so the point of this is this was one of the only entries that really systematically used learning engineering to develop its actual educational activities and assessments. And then we're still collecting data in the field for what's, what's going on and actually analyzing the data to improve the product continuously. The second example is the longest running and perhaps the most uh, famous. And it's um, uh, a high school curriculum and intelligent tutor, cognitive tutor, uh, to teach students algebra, the cognitive tutor for algebra, um, which Ken and his colleagues developed uh, in the 1990s and has been deployed um, very widely and has been shown on many, many occasions in many, many contexts uh, to be uh, very successful in demonstrably improving learning outcomes. So here's a graph that just shows you um, the way students are performing uh, on a whole bunch of different uh, assessments. Uh, uh, the blue is the cognitive tutor algebra students, and the green are the traditional curriculum. You can see, right, on all of them, uh, the cognitive tutor students do better, and some of them, like problem solving, uh, they do dramatically better. So this was subjected to a very wide randomized test by the RAND Corporation independently. There was 140 schools, 70 used the cognitive tutor for algebra curriculum, 70 did not across all different socioeconomic strata, right? Um, and what, what was found was that on the average, high school students who were in the cognitive tutor algebra curriculum learned almost a full year more of algebra during the trial. So dramatic results, and, and, and this has been um, supported by a spin-off business called Carnegie Learning, uh, and that has now supported approximately 10 million students uh, in, in something like uh, thousands and thousands of schools across the country. And the final example, um, Marshall Lovett can talk more about, which is a course that was developed with learning engineering techniques uh, on statistics. It's an intro to statistics course uh, that's meant to teach the basic concepts of probability and statistics to introductory college students. And it was designed um, in the course of several um, years of um, using cognitive task analysis, uh, uh, building activities and assessments along the lines I was discussing. And then it's been studied uh, in a number of different contexts. And not only is it actually producing more learning gain, but it's doing so in half the time. So we now have repeated results in which students using the OLI statistics course um, can learn in half the time uh, in terms of learning gain about six times as much as traditional curricula uh, delivered in, in a traditional way. So it's meant to be used as a hybrid course, partly online and partly in person. And uh, it's been replicated now in many different contexts uh, by independent researchers. And so we're quite confident it works. So there's an example on the primary, secondary, and higher education level. And there's many, many, many others. So all of this convinces us that you know if one takes this approach, uh, which is not necessarily cheap or not necessarily easy, uh, what you will get is le learning gains that are demonstrably better than otherwise. <clears throat> so our main goals right, in doing this, this work and these activities are, are really twofold. And the first one is to, to make learning engineering right, as a set of techniques and tools and code available to everyone, usable by everyone. So it's not something that you have to have someone else do for you. It's really to support you or whoever right, is trying to improve education at your context in your institution. Because what we believe is that learning and what works is local. Right? We can't build something and throw it over the fence and expect it to work in your context, in your context, in your context. What we can hope for is that you will start where you think is appropriate, and then you will need to collect data and iterate and improve the object that you're trying to use to teach in your own local context. So instead of building things that you can use right, um, as educational content, our focus is on building tools 
for you to actually develop your own and improve your own educational content. So that's our approach. And then I think the other goal is, and I think that everybody here would agree with this, uh, that this is much too big a job for uh, a small team like ours, perpetually underfunded by our provost. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. He's a friend of mine. That, that's going to that's gonna cost me a bottle of scotch right there. <laughs> But it's, it's much bigger than what we can possibly do. And so what we're really also about is trying to invite you as a group of people who are interested in improving education to form a community and join us by improving the techniques, improving the tools, and improving the code, and improving the content. So those are our two goals. And so what we're going to show you across the uh, course of the uh, two, two and a half hours to follow uh, is going to be given to you in the context of what we see as the life cycle of educational projects. And, and so we have this, this simple diagram we argued over for weeks, which words and which particular font style. But, but, but this is the one we're going with. <laughs> and the basic idea is uh, that you have to design uh, activities, assessments, educational materials, uh, and then you have to develop them. And then you have to deliver them to the student in some form. right? And then when you deliver them to the student, the assumption is that you're going to get data on what happened, and then you're going to use that data to discover ways in which you can improve right, those educational materials. And so this is a cycle that's never ending. You have to design, develop, deliver, discover about how to do things better, and then redesign, redevelop, redeliver, ad infinitum. And so the toolkit that we're, we're, we're trying to um, get out there in a big way uh, is really, in our minds, best understood as not just tools, but really a set of techniques. And some of those techniques don't have many tools, right? But we know from the literature and from practice uh, uh, of those sort of techniques and that they work. And then a set of tools, right, that are in various states of development. Some of them are very highly developed and some of them are not. And then a set of content that we can develop with those tools and techniques. And then at the very bottom layer, right, code that actually implements those tools much of which and all of which eventually we're going to try to make open access so that the code itself is available to the community. So there's no danger that the tools or whoever supports them will go away because you can get the code and implement it in your own particular environment and develop it further in your own environment without fear of anybody else uh, going away. And so these techniques and tools are really to support applying uh, the learning engineering um, perspective, techniques, etc., to the life cycle of educational projects. So let me just now stop and give you a, a very, very high level, quick set of examples for each of these stages and what they mean. And then I'm going to turn it over to uh, this team, and they're going to show you um, a variety of uh, tools and how they actually have um, helped us close the cycle or develop things that we think uh, actually work. So you know, for design, Right, design doesn't happen in a vacuum. It usually has data that it responds to. It should respond to data. And, and the technique that I'm going to just um, talk about for a, a split second uh, is called cognitive task analysis. And so the idea of trying to find out what are the skills, what are the concepts, what are the things you want to teach the student, right? Uh, if you want to go far beyond just introspection, sitting down with a pencil and paper and saying, here's what I'm going to design, right? Cognitive task analysis is now a well-developed psychological technique for getting you to those concepts and skills in a reasonably data-driven way. And so the example uh, I'll give is um, we knew that teaching graphical models, not just to Michael Feldstein, but to everybody, was complicated. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just on a roll today. <laughs> so. We actually, we actually saw students having a lot of trouble with deseparation. And so we said, let's try to figure out what it is we need to teach students to actually get deseparation across. Deseparation is how to take a causal graph and figure out what implications it shows or it entails that we could test in the data. So we did a cognitive task analysis uh, on the deseparation skill. Uh, we took several experts, and we had them do think alouds. And then from that, we identified four basic big components of that skill that we had to actually teach in a careful way. Uh, you had to identify undirected paths, nodes as colliders. I won't go into that. Uh, Michael will kill me. <laughs> and um, 
we did so. And then we had to actually say, um, let's develop, right, uh, from that cognitive task analysis and those skills, something that will deliver to the students in an effective way instruction about those skills and concepts. And so we built a cognitive tutor. And we did so with a cognitive tutor authoring toolkit, which made it very, very easy and very feasible to do it for particular examples about deseparation quite quickly relative to how long it took to do it 20 years ago, which was millions of dollars, dozens of people, and lots of years of development. So now you can use the cognitive tutor authoring toolkit uh, and develop cognitive tutors uh, in, in sometimes as little as an hour or two. So the, the code for the cognitive tutor for um, authoring toolkit will be available this summer. Uh, and here's a picture of the tutor we developed for deseparation. I'll be testing Michael on that later. Uh, the third stage is delivery, right? And when I say delivery, um, that encompasses anything, including giving a lecture. Uh, but in this case, we had developed a tutor. And so the question is how to deliver it to the students in the context of a bigger course. And so we used uh, interactive online modules that would present the ideas behind these techniques with videos uh, that were short, followed by interactive activities, learned by doing, et cetera. And those learned by doing activities included the deseparation cognitive tutor that we built. So the tool for actually embedding all that and collecting data so that we could analyze the data later, right, is the Open Learning Initiative platform. And Norm is going to talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, and the example was a research methods course uh, that Ken supervises, but many of us teach in. So I teach a couple of weeks on causal discovery. Uh, and we built modules to teach deseparation and other things as part of that. Um, the code base underlying the Open Learning Initiative, uh, we hope to have completely free and open uh, by October of this year. <clears throat> so the final piece uh, of the life cycle um, is discover. Now that you have data you've collected uh, on what the students are doing, you need to find something from that data that will help you in an intelligent way redesign, redevelop, redeliver uh, the materials and the assessments for the students. And so an example of this builds on what I did yesterday um, is causal discovery. You have data on what the students have done and how they've actually performed on quizzes or in final exams and a pretest, perhaps. And then the idea is by what mechanisms, right, are they actually learning or not learning? And so there's a tool for doing causal discovery that we've developed uh, in a separate project, but now is available fully, free, and um, um, completely uh, open source code is called Tetrad. And um, the example I'll give you in a second is what you saw yesterday. Uh, but there is the website for the, for the code base. Uh, it's available freely on GitHub. And there's lots of support um, devoted to causal discovery. There's workshops. There's tutorials online. We do a summer course every year. Uh, and there's lots of other tools uh, that are associated with it. And here's the example of uh, what we learned from a course at Pitt um, in terms of what was actually helping students learn. In year one, we found that printing out modules was inhibiting students doing exercises. We changed that in year two, uh, and things got better. And so we closed the loop here. Getting data uh, really helped us understand how to fix the course so students um, were doing more interactive activities and then learning more. So we have all these tools, right? You'll see several of them this morning. So the second part of this idea is for us to move from just a set of tools, right, that anybody can use to an ecosystem in which the tools, right, are in some sense able to talk to each other. And so part of the activity that we've been engaged in is building a backbone um, that we think integrates and makes interoperable to some degree uh, these tools. So Tetrad now talks to LearnSphere. LearnSphere actually embeds Tetrad in it. And there's lots of other pairwise tools that by, uh, by virtue of necessity have been talking to each other. And so we're trying to make this as general as possible so that um, when you have a tool or an approach, you can plug it into the backbone and you can get access to any of the tools right, that we have developed and they can talk to each other as, as, as easily as possible through this backbone. Uh, of interoperability. So the idea there is you're going to have some of your own tools, some of your own approaches, and, and it would be great to have those connected to and amplifying the, the, uh, the suite of tools that we are developing here. So the final thing I want to say is, um, uh, as I said before, we are 
very, very interested in forming a community. And the community um, uh, is all of you and anybody else that you can talk to uh, or interested in joining us. And what we'd like is for everybody to use the techniques, to use the tools, right, to help us develop content, to help us improve the code, uh, and then to contribute new techniques, uh, new code, new, new tools, and then to collaborate with us and each other on education and research projects. So we have lots of data sets. We have lots of people who are interested in doing research on your data sets. And so the idea of communicating, forming a community so that we can all do this together uh, is very, very important to us. With that, um, let me stop and turn this over to Norm Beer, who is the executive director of the Simon Initiative and the director of the Open Learning Initiative. Uh, and Norm's going to illustrate in a deeper dive some of the, yeah, some of the uh, techniques I'm, uh, um, I'm talking about to illustrate. But before I turn it over to Norm, he's signaling to me that I should ask you if you have any questions or comments before we move on. So let me open it up to everybody, and that's the overview. I hope that was uh, helpful and will be helpful going forward. So it's either crystal clear and you know exactly what I'm saying, or nobody has any idea what I'm saying. Good. OK, let me turn it over to Norm. Uh, thank you so much, and I look forward to the rest of the month.